All right, so if you have your phone this morning, pull it out. Everybody, pull your phone out. I know this is um, probably a lot of times you don't hear a pastor say, hey, everybody get your phone out and turn it on, okay? Everybody get your phone out, turn it on. Everybody got it out, turned on. We want everybody to, to play along this morning. Wave it at me. Just turn around, wave it at me so I know everybody's got it out. Okay, okay, all right. Some of you don't have phones. That's okay. Some of us are recording, periscoping. Here's what I want, here's what I want us to do to get started. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and you can vote by raising your phone or not whether you agree with the statement, okay? So here we go. Here, here's the first question. How many of you would say, I love my phone? I mean, it is the most wonderful thing. I just love it. Raise it up. Anybody say, I love it? Okay. All right. Yeah, I guess some of those. All right. Now, how many of you would say, I hate this thing? I mean, I... <laughs> Larry's up first over there. How many of you say, I just can't stand it, Joe? You know, I mean, it... well, maybe some of you are like me. Okay. I kind of fall in this third category, and it goes like this. I have a love-hate relationship with this thing. How many of you say that's you? Okay, that, that's a lot of us here. I mean, I love it and I hate it. I love it because it gives me accessibility, really, to the whole wide world. But I hate it because it makes the whole wide world accessible to me, right? And it, it, So let's do a little experiment. Everybody turn your volume all the way up. All the way up. Everybody got your volume all the way up? Volume all the way up. Now, I've got a small prize for the two individuals who win this. All right? When I say go, you can't do it before that. Everybody be watching your neighbor. Nobody cheats this morning because the prize is just enormous. You ready? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to call somebody in this service, and as soon as you get that, that call, you stand up. If, you, if you're that person who gets a call, go right now. Go, go, go. Stand up. Who was that? Wayne. All right. All right. So, who called you? You. Oh, we got to do this again. It's okay. Yeah, let's keep it off speaker. Okay. All right. Oh, you ready? Hey, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Okay, you ready? Back to scratch. Zero. Everybody turn your phones off. Hold them up. All right. Now go in. Don't start yet. Don't start yet. On you ready? Set. Go. I got one. Who was that over there? All right, who called you? Your mother? Okay, let's give them a hand. They did great. Even though you may have used speed dial, we're not going to check. So you wanna, who wants to come and claim your gifts? Come on, Brandon. This is Doritos Cool Ranch. <laughs> and you can't eat those during the service. It won't disrespect me at all, but maybe the people around you might not like it, all right? Okay, now, turn your phones down. <laughs> and uh, still follow along with us in the bcnow.church if you want to. There's some places where you can take some notes in there this morning. But the reason I wanted us to do this is because uh, 10 years ago, that would have been really hard to do. I mean, 25 years ago, it would have been absolutely impossible to do because we still had the phone hanging on the wall. How many of you remember this, this phone? How many of y'all remember that? See your hands. How many of you just don't remember a phone like that? Let's see your hands. If you, yeah, we've got the whole generation there, right? But today we're accessible 24-7. And listen, it's all Marty Cooper's fault. And you're going, who's Marty Cooper? And that's, that's a good question. He was born and raised in Chicago. He got a college degree in engineering. Got an engineering job at Motorola. And he got involved uh, at Motorola. And Marty Cooper was the guy 
who asked the question that ultimately made all of us accessible 24-7. And here's what he began to ask. Why is it that when we call, when we want to call and talk to a person, we have to call a place? So he began to dig more and more into this question, and eventually he figured out how to call a person, not just a place. And that led to the invention of this, the Dynatech 8000X. Anybody here have one of those bricks? Probably not. That's one of the first ones. Not your average pocket phone, right? And eventually it evolved and we got these Razor phones. How many of y'all had one of those now? Let's see, yeah, more and more people got, got into that. That's your, you know, beam me up, Scotty, right? It's like... We thought we were something. And, and today we have this magnificent wonder of technology. And I think a lot of us have this love and hate relationship with it. Because we're more accessible than any people throughout history. Did you realize that research tells us that we check these things 221 times a day? That is every 4.3 minutes. And you're going, that's all? I got that beat. Some of your parents are like, oh, you need to see my daughter. You haven't seen anything, right? I mean, we check them at work. We check them at home. We check them in the bathroom. Don't act like you don't do that. You're just, you're just horrible, okay? But here's where we're going with this thing, really. You're accessible. I'm accessible. We're all accessible. Well, I want you to lean in here with me. And I wanted to try to take a few minutes and set this up. So we're starting this new series today. But the question is this. Yes, we are accessible. Are you available? Are you available? Because being accessible is fundamentally different than being available. I mean, you can see this on the screen. Does assess accessibility equal availability? I think the answer to that is a flat out, absolutely no. Two totally different things. You know, during um, Hurricane Harvey uh, down in Houston, a lady was stuck in her garage with two dogs, her husband, and a disabled uncle, right? And so, uh, in a panic, she called 911, and they told her, they said, we'll send someone over. We'll send somebody over to, to pick you up. Well, 30 minutes passed, and nobody shows up. One hour goes by, and nobody shows up. The water's rising, and they have no other place to go. Two hours pass, and now the water is virtually knee-deep. Three hours pass, and water's up to the waist, and still no emergency help. And here's the point. 911 was accessible, but it was not available. So she ended up calling a news agency that came and rescued them. So there's a big difference between being accessible and being available. And what I wonder, just relationally, if we are people, or we are a people who are accessible to one another, <clears throat> but not really available for one another. And listen, I'm telling you, the problem is not technology or social media. I know it is misused, and I know it can be misused. It's just a tool. The problem's me. The problem's me. Because oftentimes I'm accessible, but am I available? And, and that's why we're starting this new series, and it will be important, I think, for a whole bunch of us, and it's called Side by Side. It's about taking a biblical look at our relationships and our friendships and how we do those most important relationships and friendships and hopefully take them to a better place side by side because inside of us, listen, inside of us we have a desire, we have this longing, uh, it's this universal out there among every person, all of us, to have relational friendships and to, and to be side by side with other people. It's in us. You may be thinking, not me, Pastor Mark, I'm an introvert, but trust me, if you've ever been in a difficult situation, you know the power of God. You know the Word of God, maybe. But isn't it incredibly wonderful to have a brother or sister in Christ, Jesus with skin on, come alongside you and help you make it through that difficult? See, that's the difference we're talking about here. Uh, Brene Brown was a good thinker and gifted writer. She put it this way. We are hardwired to connect with others, 
It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. And without it, there is suffering. You know, the Apostle Paul even reinforces it in different ways by saying that, he, that, that, hey, I want you to understand something. The church, you've been designed for this community. You've been designed for relationships. You've been designed for friendships. And as a community of Christ followers, we're to connect together in a meaningful way. Okay? And he explained this in Ephesians 4, 16. He talks, he talks this way. He says, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And listen, I'm going to push us a little bit in this series, all right? Because if you want to have friendships, if you want to have relationships that are biblically side by side, Paul is saying here, when each part is working properly, this is going to happen, all right? So during this series, we're going to talk about how do you move from just being accessible to being available and then from being available to being authentic, and then from being authentic to being accountable. There's a story in Mark chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. When you get to Mark chapter 2, say, let's go. Mark chapter 2. And I love this story. So we're going to be unpacking this a little bit more in um, our uh, Wednesday night life group. Because we've got some theologians in there that are going to uh, enlighten us. Mark chapter 2. He says, and, and when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. Talking about Jesus here, right? And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now picture this scene with me. You have this paralyzed guy who was obviously in need. We'll just let this represent his mat or his bed would have been like a mat, but it had been much bigger than this. This is just my camping mat that I use for, to sit on or kneel on, put outside my tent or, or whatever. But we'll just let this represent that today. He also has, right, this group of friends here. And there's four of them, we know from the Bible. And what they do is they hear that Jesus is in town, and they want to go see him. They want to listen. They want to meet Jesus. And perhaps even they can take their friend to meet this Jesus, and he would be healed. Wouldn't that be incredible? So they're probably talking, and they're saying, hey, let's go meet Jesus. And I just imagine maybe that this, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here, I'm thinking that the paralyzed guy was probably going, hey, look at me, guys. I, I'm on this mat. I can't move. What do you mean, let's go meet Jesus? He's like, I can't do it, I can't do it. And they were, I bet they were like, yes, you're going. Yeah, come on, you're going with us. We're not leaving here without you. And finally, all four guys grabbed the mat and they began to pull him or carry him through town. Now, I imagine that might have been an awkward scene as they tried to navigate him through town, trying to get him there. But eventually, they get him to this home where Jesus is inside, and he's teaching, and he's speaking. And they had hoped that they would get a chance to meet Jesus. And they also hoped that their friend would get a chance to see, meet Jesus. But the place was packed, right? I mean, it was, it was just packed. And not only is the house full, but th there's people all around it. There's people leaning in the windows, trying to hear what Jesus is saying. So, what we... So what, what do we do, and what, what, what do we know here from, from this? I think that one of his friends was probably thinking, do we wait here? Do we just wait on Jesus? Maybe when everything's over, he come out, and maybe he'll have time, and he can come up, and he can, he can talk to us for a little bit. But I kind of have a theory. Just theory. Go with me. Just a minute, Okay. In every group, there's always one, right? All, always one. Always one who's got an idea. 
especially you get four guys together and you're trying to solve something. One of those guys, well, you know, hey, I got an idea. What if we get up on the roof? <laughs> and the others had to be looking at him and saying, what do, you, what do you mean, get up on the roof? And, and the one will always respond when the rest of the group starts to question him. He's the one in your group. And you know what he says every time. What is it? Just trust me, right? Just trust me. So the next thing you know, they get this paralyzed friend up on the roof. All four friends. And they begin to dig through the roof. I can just imagine Jesus standing there teaching and all the stuff, particles of the roof begin to fall in. And the hole gets bigger and bigger. And the people sitting out, I mean, can you imagine sitting here and all of a sudden somebody opened, saw, you know. Anyway, same principle at work here. But I, I can just, I can just see everybody, it's falling on all the stuff down, down below. And then all of a sudden, that big hole comes this man that they're letting down probably on ropes right into the, into, in front of Jesus. <laughs> right in front of Jesus. Everyone must have been staring at him going, check this out. There's a dude coming through the ceiling. Now he's on the ground. Jesus, what are you, what's, what's going on? I can just see Jesus teaching and the man hitting the, the floor and looking up at Jesus and Jesus, you know, kind of looking, looking at him and everybody was staring. And I just imagine Jesus maybe gazing up at the hole in the roof. You know, he looks at the man and he looks up and all of a sudden he sees eight eyeballs looking back down through and they're all up there going, we don't know what happened. So they've gotten their friend to Jesus. I love verse 5. Look at it. And when Jesus saw, check this out, circle it, their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. I love it says there, when Jesus saw their faith. Now, this wasn't exactly what they came for, but it was exactly what he needed. Now, everybody there was not excited about what was going on. You follow me? Let's pick his story up, the religious leaders in verse 6. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? And then he like he often did, ask a question. He said, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Well, we have a, a man here whose spirit was forgiven, and his body was changed. He, he was healed. His life was just completely, totally, totally, totally changed. And here we are, check this out, here we are over 2,000 years later, and we're talking about it. What an incredible story that God included in His Word so that we would be here today, even today when we're talking about it. Now, here's what I want us to get. And maybe this is why God has you here today. I want you to think about your relationships. I want you to think about your friendships, right? Think, think about those with me today. That man, a paralyzed man, he was forever changed because of the faith of his friends who were just simply available. They were available. He was forever changed by a group of friends and their faith who just made themselves 
available. And here's what I find interesting about this story. The, the man on the mat, the paralyzed man, he needed healing, and he also needed forgiveness. And as far as I know, in every commentary, in every place I've dug, there was nothing special about these four men. All right? They were not pastors. I, I mean, we, we have no, they were not certified EMTs. They were not doctors. This is just a group of friends who were what? Available. They made themselves available. You know, there's a verse in the Old Testament that I always find just really super encouraging. I remember I was walking around the, the streets in Budapest, Hungary, and I was just amazed, number one, that I was actually there, but uh, God, God had me there, and I was, I was walking around, and I was thinking to myself, um, God, I feel so disqualified to be here. What could you possibly do with this boy from East Tennessee over here trying to do missions and tell people about Jesus? How could, how could you possibly use me? And this verse always comes to mind. In Second Chronicles 16, 9, you've probably memorized it. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. And I believe what this verse always reminds me of is that God is looking for people who are willing and are available to Him. For his glory, for his kingdom, for his renown. So the question today is for us, are we even in the line of sight of God? Who of us are available? Have you ever needed like a pen really quick uh, to, to write something down? And there's like a whole cup of them sitting there, you know what I'm talking about? And you pick one up, Nothing. Another one, nothing. Another one, nothing. And all of a sudden, there's a crayon, and you pick up the crayon, and you do the task. So the crayon was not the best tool, but the crayon was what? Available. We got a door in our house, a doorknob, that um, likes to come loose all the time. And um, every time, it seems like I try to find the screwdriver, it's not where I left it last. I don't have any idea why. My, my wife's not in here. She's serving the kids this morning. I'm not going to blame her at all. So, I could not find the screwdriver, right? So what I do, I go down to the kitchen, and I pull out the silverware drawer, and I get the what knife? Nay, nay. It is officially the peanut butter knife. I don't know who said it was the butter knife. It is the peanut butter knife. Let's just let that ring loud from here on out throughout all eternity. Can I get an amen? amen. Just kidding you. Now, the peanut butter knife was not the best tool, right? But it was. So you go to the bathroom, and there's no toilet paper. And you find yourself there. The last person didn't leave enough. And they obviously didn't replenish under the sink where they were supposed to. And you gaze to your left and you notice a Sports Illustrated magazine. Kind of gross. Not the best tool, but it was what? Some of you are thinking, I would never do that. I wouldn't either. Here's, here's what I want you to ask yourself. In all seriousness this morning... Is this, will you make yourself available? Because God is looking, hey, who's available? Who's going to stand up for this need? Who's willing to cook a meal for, for the homeless? Who's willing to, to serve another family that may want to come to a life group, just keep their children for a little bit so that maybe their lives are changed, that they can do life, something that they've needed so much? Not me, I'm too busy. I'm just saying, would you make yourselves available to be that kind of friend? I think there are really a couple... Important things that we can learn from this story uh, about moving from a very accessible culture to being available people ready to make a difference in the lives of each other. And here's a couple things. If you're taking notes, I would say this very simple thing. Side by side friends are available to carry each other's mat. They're available to do it. They make themselves available to carry each other's mat. But I know that can be awkward 
It really can be. Someone else may see you and go, why would you do that? They may question that. It may, it may be strange. These men had to walk through the city carrying, carrying him. Catch this. In this story, I believe the mat may very well symbolize all of our brokenness. Let's just do a quick test. How many of you have some kind of brokenness in your life? Let's see your hands. Yeah, all of us, right? All of us have parts of our lives that are not working well, right? And sometimes we're afraid, I think, to get close to people because of their flaws. And we're afraid we won't know what to say or we won't know what, what to do. And some of us will say, I don't want anybody to get close to my mat. Get, get it over here. I, I don't want anybody to know my shortcomings. I don't want anybody to get near this. Why? Because I've got too much pride. And I don't believe that, that Jesus intended for us to do life together. And I don't believe half of what Paul wrote when he talked about the local church and the community and the importance of being together and sharing life and doing life with one another and studying the Word and breaking bread and eating chili. Threw that in there. But again, ask yourself, are you going to be available for the kinds of friendship where you carry each other's mats? Are we going to, are we going to be there? I, I, I was thinking about this this week and as I was praying, there have been so many key times in, in my own life when others have kind of picked up the mat for me, and, and I'm grateful. And some of you have heard probably a, a lot of some of my brokenness in the past and how my family's been harmed in ministry. And there were a time um, in, in ministry where I just wanted to say, God, I'm done. I was young. And um, if this is the way this, the churches are, if this is the way pastors are, and then, you know, I'm, I'm out. I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, Eastman. I can, I can retire, hopefully by 55, and I'll be, I'll be done. That's, I'll just serve my family that way. I'll serve the local church. I'm I'm done. And I, I'm, I met with a pastor right after this wounding of my heart and spirit. And he sat across the table from me and he said, Mike, I'm going to tell you something. And, and this has always been one of the things, I think, fresh on my heart for Believer's Church that we, I don't know if you know, sometimes we'll have people who will come in, they'll be here for a season and then they, they move on. I think a lot of why that happens is because they have brokenness or they've been wounded, they've been hurt. A lot of times by churches, a lot of times by staff, and they just need to come. And maybe, hopefully, your love on them and teaching the truth and, and just saying, hey, we're real people, real problems, and we're looking for real answers. And God heals their hearts, and then maybe they're ready to go back to where God intended them to be. I think that I, I've seen that happen. I really have. He came along, and he sat across from me, and he said, Mike, I just, I, he said, look, Every church is not that way. And every pastor is not the way this pastor's behaved. And he said, will you give me a chance? And Karen will tell you, I really struggled with this, with this one. Because it wasn't so much that my heart was hurt or wounded, it was my family too. And that, that really bothered me. And um, I wasn't near the mature man that I am today, and I had trouble just kind of digesting so much of that, right? And I finally said, yes. I'll come and we'll serve together. And we had four wonderful years of ministry, a wonderful church. He and I were, were like this, and just an incredible ministry together. But here's what I want you to see in that. You had your now pastor who's hurt, wounded, ready to walk away from ministry. Another man comes along, encourages, inspires, brings him on his team. They have wonderful, incredible ministry together. And he, you know what he did? He picked up my mat. He said, come and join us. Come and be a part of our team. And he helped carry that for me. And I know some of you, some of you have those stories. And here's why he did that. You know why he did that? Because he was available. You know, every marriage goes through a difficult season or two. Uh, 
even Karen and I, right? And I remember getting some really good advice from godly men through my journey. I mean, I had to be willing to go to them and say, hey, look, here's what's happened. And would you pray with me? Can you, can you help share with me? Point me in the right direction. And, um, and they did. And to me, it's almost like they're picking up my mat and our marriage to help me to see the truth. So we all have mats. We all have brokenness in our lives. Okay, so lean in here with me. We're, we're, we're just about done. I want you to catch this. You ready? Someone else's miracle could be depending on your availability to pick up their mat. You know, I don't want to leave here with that kind of pressure on my shoulders today. Really? I mean, what they need most, God wants to use you. He's looking at you. Are you available today? Are you willing to pick up their mat? Or are you just afraid of getting your hands dirty? Number two, real quick. Side-by-side friends are available to bring each other to Jesus. Isn't that what these four friends did here? I mean, he had this physical brokenness in his life. We all have broken seasons, brokenness in our lives. And God is looking at your heart today. And he strongly desires to use you to lead someone else to his son, Jesus Christ. So we need each other sometimes to lead us back to the, into the arms of the forgiveness of God. I love what Andy Stanley said. He says this way, Your friends determine the quality and direction of your life. Another man told me early on, he said, Mike, the, the two things that's going to influence your life more than anything will be the books you read and the people you meet. But beyond that, it's the friends that we have. So with that in mind, let me give you two challenges. Number one is this. They're so simple. You could you guess them already. Number one is be available. Just be available. Where, How? We've already talked about life groups. If you, if, you, if you haven't talked with your spouse or friend about attending a, a life group, do it. Come and be here. We're not going to have anybody stand up in the room and uh, give a dissertation on a particular passage of Scripture. It's come and hang out. We'll talk. We'll have fun together. We'll break bread. Amen? Some of you could help carry the mat for those who need child care. Is God speaking to you about that? Maybe you seem kind of awkward at first, but that may be exactly what God wants you to do. Maybe it's missions. Maybe today, we don't know exactly how many families are involved this time around that need someone to come and help pick up their mat by way of a meal, by coming and just hanging out with them at, at dinner time, or to maybe even stay overnight with them and serve in a way where they just have a need for somebody to be there so that they can be accountable during that time. You can sign up today on your way out. Okay? Serving. Serving somewhere. The second thing is this, staying available. So if you're not as available as you once were, can I ask you a question? And you know who you are. What got you off course? So I'm challenging all of us this morning as a faith family that we would carry the mats of our faith family, especially not just in here, but those people we come in contact outside the church. Let's, let's, let's do that together. Let's pick up the mats for our life groups. Let's pick up the mats of those who are hurting in our community, those who are homeless in our community. And maybe, maybe one day, you may need someone to come along and help pick up your mat and carry you. So remember this. Someone else's miracle could be depending on your availability to just pick up their mat. Let's pray.